When the Second World War broke out in the late summer of 1939, Picasso was in Antibes. He returned to Paris and lived for a while in Royan, a seaside resort in the neighborhood of Bordeaux. Café in Royan, 1940. Sitting nude, 1940. Sometime after the outbreak of the war, Picasso returns to Paris. He is not allowed to exhibit. Still life with Oxcal, 1942. As Picasso is short of painting tools and equipment, he writes a play called How to Catch Luck by the Tail. Brassai said of him, he was invited to go to Mexico or New York. The consuls insisted again and again, do leave, why do you stay in Paris? But he wanted to stay, and his presence in that town was a moral support. In my opinion, he showed great courage, as not only he, but also his paintings were in great danger. Paris with Notre Dame, 1945. Picasso makes the acquaintance of Françoise Gillot. Françoise, 1945. Woman as flower. Six weeks after the liberation of Paris, Picasso exhibits his works in the Salon d'Automne. In 1946, Picasso stays in golfe juin for a while. In the same year, he starts to work in the Chateau d'Antibes. Monsieur Daud de la Souchère, the keeper of the museum there, recounts, In this chateau, which like all castles has something magic about it, Picasso spent six months of his life. He worked here. All he produced in this half year, he left here. And today, the chateau is a Picasso museum. Picasso said to me, I have always wanted to paint big surfaces, but the state has never provided me with any. So I answered him, if you need big surfaces, I can give you them. He asked, but where? And I said, in the Chateau Grimaldi, the Chateau of Antibes. I accept your offer with great enthusiasm, was his answer. Au Chateau d'Antibes. Et il m'a répondu cette phrase, j'y vais dans l'enthousiasme. In 1948, Picasso buys a small house in Valoris, La Galoise. Many times he's painted this house and its surroundings. Anyone who knows his paintings is acquainted with the trees, the little front garden, and the water reservoir. Picasso in his room in La Galoise. portrait of his daughter, Paloma, and below this, a copy of a painting by Lucas Cranach and two paintings of the tax collector Rousseau, Rousseau's wife, and a self-portrait. A double portrait of Picasso's children, Claude and Paloma, with Françoise Gillot in the background. Claude and Paloma when drawing in La Galoise. One Christmas Eve in La Galoise with Paloma, Maya, Claude and Paul. Under the Christmas tree, there's a Sicilian cart for the children. The objects on the mantelpiece are displayed by Picasso himself, and above it are plates with bullfighting scenes by Picasso. Picasso in his room in La Galoise. A Spanish decorated corner with a fan. Rooftops of Valoris. Picasso is working on a charcoal drawing. Jaime Sabatez says, his paintings talk. He talks to the paintings, and the paintings are talking to us. Hélène Parmelin, a friend and neighbor, describes Picasso's look as scrutinizing and penetrating, as if it were fixed on something invisible, an overwhelming, scorching, and dazzling look. 
Monsieur and Madame Ramier, the owners of the Madura pottery, report on Picasso's first visit to their workshop. Georges Ramier remembers that they had not recognized him at first. And Suzanne Ramier reports, it was the year 1946. Picasso came to our exhibition at Valoris. Everything started there. He immediately asked if we would let him work in our workshop. Picasso had work in the Madura pottery. Later on, he set up his own workshop in an old factory shed. Suzanne Ramier shows one of the plaster moulds made by Picasso and explains the new technique, the so-called graphic ceramic, which he developed. With this technique, completely flat reliefs are transferred onto plaster moulds. The result is something between graphic art and relief. In the use of colours, Picasso as a potter also went new ways. Often in a light-hearted manner and with great imagination, he turned traditional methods upside down and thereby achieved quite astonishing results. Picasso says that as early as 1907, he'd made small ceramics in Paris. It was only in Valoris that he started to work seriously in the pottery. Little by little, he learned to work with modeling clay rolled out to a millimeter. He enjoyed modeling this extremely thin material into the most unexpected shapes. Madame Ramier believes that it was mainly the mixture of sculpture and painting that made him interested in ceramics, allowing him at the same time to work as an engraver too. She says, we were not real traditional potters, but we stuck to certain traditional rules. And there comes Picasso bursting in like a bomb and doing the opposite of what was customary until then. Picasso has revolutionized our handicraft. He risks everything. And even things which were considered impossible or not allowed are a success with him. He turns handicrafts almost upside down. But when he does it, it turns out all right. Should I dare what Picasso dares, it would certainly be a disaster. Whereas for Picasso, nothing goes wrong. He's a genius. Picasso was a genial artisan. Spirit and gesture worked together in him, complemented one another and created together. His hands gave birth to his ideas. The touch of his hands on the clay always provided Picasso with a great joy. His hands seemed made to mould to compress, to bend and form this natural material. The village of Valoris had provided Picasso with a new possibility for creative activity. Picasso thanked the village with the gift of the bronze statue, Man with Sheep. The late summer of 1953 brought a decisive turning point in the life of Picasso. The separation from Françoise Gillot, the mother of his children Paloma and Claude, who had been his companion in life for about 10 years. He suffered from loneliness. In November, he started to work on a series of drawings. From mid-December onwards, he produced at least one sheet a day for a month. The poet Michel Leris interprets this collection of drawings as Picasso and the human comedy. The diary of a horrible journey through hell, describing a personal crisis in which Picasso questions everything. A visual diary without words. Leris says, this series of scenes brings back associations with the bullfight and even of a particularly dangerous phase of the faena in which the matador stands almost undefended in front of the bull. Art as a whole in its many facets and love in all its forms. These are the themes which, in the true meaning of the words, flow from his pen. His devotion to his work seems to be total. Formal problems are of no importance. Without any aesthetic considerations or fear for commonness, the painter throws on paper what he has in his heart, 
or what goes through his mind. No one, not even the greatest genius, can escape from the facts of human existence. And neither art nor love can avoid the passing by of the time, which plays a hide-and-seek game with us, in which the winner is at the same time the loser. These drawings show painters of different ages, young and old, short-sighted, sharp-eyed, tall and small, good-looking and ugly men. All of them stand in front of a young girl of rare beauty, and the encounter between the painter and his model is nothing more than a special case of the man-woman confrontation. Painter and model, man and woman, in art as in love. For Picasso, it always comes down to a duel between subject and object. In all eternity, they stand facing each other, separated by a gulf which nobody, however genial he may be, can bridge. The London art collector, Roland Penrose, sees these drawings as reflections of Picasso on his own personal dilemma, which helped him to free himself from his obsessions. As to the painter-model theme, Penrose says, the painter-model theme also includes the theme of love, the love of the artist for his model, which he brings to expression in the painting he makes of his model. Furthermore, in these drawings, the problem of the painter is analyzed. The picture within the picture pushes reality more and more into the background. The bearded painter, whose painting is canvas, ignores his model and occupies himself exclusively with his unknown work of art. The critic studies every detail and admires the smallest blot of paint on the canvas. In this magnificent mask, which goes on from English Christmas scenes, Commedia dell'arte and ancient death rites, the artist introduces his fantastic virtuosity as a means of self-irony. Never before was so much artistic talent wasted so cheerfully in order to ridicule art. And never has it been proved so clearly that for somebody who's able to create all he wants with his ten fingers and his mind, nothing really essential has been changed in the end by a crisis in soul and body. Penrose goes on to say, one must not forget that for Picasso, art and life are one and the same thing. When Picasso loves a woman, then the eye of the lover is not to be separated from that of the painter. This series must not be understood as an occasional skirmish with various forms of painting, but as an effort to penetrate to the heart of the problem, to express the tragedy of the struggle between the painter and his painting, in which the painter cannot see beyond his painting. It's the tragedy of a man who is incapable of seeing the most beautiful amongst women other than with the eyes of a painter. In a further series of drawings, Picasso dealt with the theme of the young woman with the masked Cupid in many variations. In these drawings, he introduces here and there a process which enables him to produce a particularly sensitive stroke which records every emotional vibration of the artist. This gives the female figures a vibrating liveliness which is not found in the previous drawings to this extent. Here, Picasso created women who were both exciting and excited, desirous and arousing desire. Here, Eros undoubtedly led his pen. They are Picasso's declarations of love to women. These nudes do not correspond to the very limited ideal of classic beauty. They are animated creatures full of life, whose physical imperfections he does not try to hide. He once said, one does not love Venus, one loves a woman. The statement he now and then makes that he's never been in love is only an apparent contradiction because from his detailed depiction of feminine charms, not only a cursory affection is evident, but also a very strong and deep love. Perhaps it's more the love for the female being rather than love for a particular woman. But his passion is so intense that even a fraction of this love 
probably weighs more than the full affection of any other man. One gains the impression that this lengthy series of drawings reflects the course so far of Picasso's life as artist and as man. A striking feature is the great number of masked figures. They symbolize the leitmotif of metamorphosis, but with irony. Will this clearly recognizable disguise prove nothing but the caricature of an enchantment, the unsuccessful attempt to pretend to be somebody one is not in reality? Since the beginning, Picasso seems to have been of the opinion that sooner or later, every myth becomes a fairy tale, that there is no ceremony which is not buffoonery at the same time, and that the miracle inevitably goes hand in hand with the charlatan. Both light and shadow sides of the metamorphosis are embodied by the dancer at the fair, who through his capers and his mask comes close to the supernatural, but at the same time is nothing but a masked scamp. Picasso did not content himself any longer with simply creating the painter and his model. He wanted to analyze the particular human situation of the model and the behavior of the painter. He was interested in the painter himself, in all painters he'd ever known, in the painter he was himself during this lonesome winter, and in the person of Pablo Picasso. Neither the question whether life was beautiful or dreadful, nor the search for new artistic forms concerned him, but the fact that human art is capable of rendering beauty to old age, youth to ugliness, and creating life from nothing. The world of the studio is examined, and the relationship between the painter and his model grows into a game, as both of them hide their true faces behind masks, she behind the bearded head of a man, and he behind the face of a beautiful girl. The art writer Pierre Dix states, the whole series is a song of praise, a hymn to women, to youth, to feminine beauty. It is at the same time a hymn to life itself and its eternal renewal, to the triumph of life over art and artist. The last drawing is like an epilogue, the model behind the mask of classic beauty with the painter facing her, discovering with amazement that not his model, but he himself is looking down ironically on himself from the canvas. In the loneliness of that winter, Picasso succeeds in using his sorrow to overcome the pain that weighs down on him by means of pure creation, knowing very well that art, just as life, is nourished by the fountains of suffering. In 1955, Picasso decided to live in the big villa called La Californie, in the hills near Cannes. This house, filled with everything one associates with the prosperous era of the turn of the century, is a strange contrast to the ideas which we connect with the name of Picasso. To him, though, it was a matter of having a lot of space. And therefore, La Californie, contrary to all appearances, was exactly what he was looking for, a wrought iron gate offered Picasso the seclusion that he'd missed so much at La Galoise. The big garden provided enough space for his sculptures and for his pet animals. Lump, one of Picasso's dogs. The goat Esmeralda was a Christmas present from the family to Picasso. On the first day, Esmeralda was allowed to move freely in and out of the house. His boxer, Jan, gets to know his new housemate. Picasso always had a strong attachment to animals, an attachment which was mutual. There's hardly any tameable animal that he's not sheltered at some time in his life. Not only animals, but birds and even reptiles. His dogs always lived in complete freedom. The beauty of animals impressed him again and again, and the mystery of their intelligence appealed to him. When Picasso established himself in this Art Nouveau building, he didn't have any walls or ceilings renovated. La Californie was in no way to be the residence of a grand lord called Picasso, but simply a place which offered him everything he needed to work, to reflect, and to live. 
Carpets, curtains, and all that he considered unnecessary luxuries vanished from the place. In empty rooms, Picasso could work undisturbed. But they did not remain empty for long. Without the least concern for interior decor, Picasso filled them with all possible profane pieces of furniture and objects, sculptures and paintings. When construction work for the building of big residential blocks in the neighborhood of La Californie was announced, Picasso knew that for him the time had come to look out for a home away in the countryside. For years he dreamt of the still intact scenery in the heart of Provence. The Chateau Vauvinard, ancestral seat of a French noble family, was for sale. The fact that this 14th century building had so many and spacious rooms made him decide to buy it. And by this purchase, the famous Mont Saint-Victoire passed into Picasso's possession as well. This gave him a special joy, as that very hill had been Cezanne's favorite theme. As soon as he feels at home in the large, whitewashed rooms, he starts to paint again. Family portraits. And again and again, Jacqueline. Hélène Parmelin writes, the Jacqueline pictures from Vauvenarg are different. They're influenced by the new surroundings, the white studio, the high pink walls, the fountains, and Cezanne's favorite hill, Saint-Victoire. The Jacquelines of Ovinag are the queens of the castle. After only two summers in Vauvenag, Picasso seemed to find Provence suddenly somewhat too rough and isolated. It was also too far away from the sea. And this is why in 1961, he returned to the Côte d'Azur, where he found an old house with the name Notre-Dame de Vie. It was on a hill high above the sea, near to the little village of Mougin, with the view of the mountains. This place pleased Picasso. He loved the mild climate and the transparent Mediterranean air, which seems to bring the surrounding mountains nearer. He was happy in Notre Dame de Vie. Here he found during the last years of his life everything he needed. Silence, and at the same time the comforts of a town like Cannes, the vicinity of the sea, and the contact with the friends and craftsmen he needed for his work. Picasso taking his customary afternoon snack, toast and lime blossom tea. Picasso decorates the cover of an old sketchbook, which a long time ago accompanied him when he traveled through Spain with Fernand Olivier. Like all the houses in which Picasso had lived, this one also changed in the shortest possible time into an enormous studio. He used almost every room as a workroom. He printed his etchings in one of the bedrooms. The painter's studios were on the ground floor. And when they'd been filled with pictures, he had the terrace roofed over and in this way gained a further studio. Hélène Parmelin said, Picasso's output exceeds any imagination. It seems as if the longer he works, the more he works. You take your leave of him, and when you return a month later, you may find 50 new pictures. 
Work is the most important, was therefore one of Picasso's favorite mottos. And throughout the whole of his life, the feeling of being free and independent was at least just as important to him. But to be free meant to him to work as much and as long as he liked. But he also knew the evil of freedom. Freedom, he said, has to be watched in painting as in other fields. The freedom not to do something means that you have to do something else instead. And so even freedom has its shackles. A painter has the freedom of not retiring and working on until he reaches a ripe old age if he's moved to do so. Picasso was moved to do so until he drew his last breath. So he worked unflaggingly. Picasso and Jacqueline got married in 1961. Picasso had an Afghan hound whom he called Kabul. No sooner had he received it as a present than it appeared in his pictures. When Kabul walked through the studio, this spelled danger, but Picasso loved his graceful appearance and elegance. Sometimes Picasso blended two themes together. Here, a female nude with the head of the Afghan hound and human features. Often, Picasso did not decide on the degree of likeness of a portrait until he'd started to work on it. How far he'd go with realism depended on the working method he applied at the time. In other words, whether he painted from memory or, which happened more rarely, from nature. With very few strokes of the brush, he was able to catch a fleeting but typical expression. He said, I am always aiming for likeness. A painter must observe nature, but he must not think that its exact copy is art. It can only pass into art by artistic symbols. And to me, surrealism was always deepened likeness, exceeding by far the visible forms and colors of things. The adventures of the cosmonauts and the first human steps taken on the moon fascinated Picasso. A personal dedication by the astronaut Alan Shepard gave him great pleasure. Charles Feld says of Picasso, To provide a condensed portrait of him, one has to mention that he's an untiring worker whose spirit is never at rest. Even when he seems to be doing nothing, he is working, because inside him there is always something happening. He has an untiring curiosity about every aspect of life. And when he discusses any subject with anybody at all, that person feels he is participating in an unusual process. Anything that happens around Picasso, everything that is said, he absorbs in some way. He stores it in his mind, and it becomes part of the abundance and of the power which are driving him to create more and more new works of art. Picasso in his studio, which he always kept locked because he didn't like people to enter, not even to clean it. Perhaps he wanted to prevent the people in his paintings from being disturbed. But occasionally he did invite in a guest and held a kind of private vernissage during which he showed his latest drawings, engravings and paintings. He was not indifferent to the effect they had on his guests. Talking with Picasso about his work, you had the impression that the people he painted actually existed. They were hidden somewhere in the studio, ready to come out as soon as the guest had left. Picasso enjoyed commenting on events he depicted as if he'd really witnessed them.
family portrait. Two Harlequins. The wealth of works which Picasso showed his favorite guests during one visit must have been overwhelming. He gave the people he allowed to visit him an uncomplicated and very warm welcome. He was sociable, but like every creative person, he also needed solitude. He lived in a state of continued tension and inner excitement. Even when he wasn't painting, the thought of his work occupied him constantly. Sabatez writes, he wanted nothing but work. When he does not work, it is because he lacks inspiration or the necessary basic requirements. And when he doesn't feel a desire to work, he doesn't enjoy anything else. Fortunately, this does not happen often, as it would be bad fortune. If he does not have the indispensable tools and materials at hand, he is usually looking for them. And if he cannot find them, he invents them. Once Picasso said, Max Jacob asked me one day why I was so kind to people who are not important to me and so hard with those who were close to me. I answered him that my kindness was a kind of indifference, but I wished my friends to be perfect. Therefore, I always find fault with them. I wanted to test them from time to time to make sure that our relation was as firm as it should be among friends. Picasso with his secretary, Miguel. When he was nearly 90, Picasso made more than 200 paintings and drawings in a single year. They were exhibited in the Papal Palace in Avignon in 1970. Jean-Jacques Lévesque, the organizer of the exhibition said, This exhibition conveys the impression of immense joy. You leave it happy, and this happiness is caused by the expression of Picasso's characters and by the atmosphere created by his colors. Moreover, the pictures are displayed very favorably, which also contributes to the great success. Here we have the chronologically arranged production of a single year before us. As Picasso has moreover dated each one of his paintings, it is not only possible to follow the process of creation in its entirety, but also to learn what he has painted, for example, on the Tuesday of a certain week in a certain month. You also gain an insight into the daily creative activity of a whole year. In later years, Picasso received every kind of thinkable and unthinkable present from friends, admirers, and petitioners. The more unusual and bizarre they were, the better he liked them. He particularly valued things which he would never have thought of buying himself, or which he didn't have the opportunity to buy. It gave him great pleasure to open the packets. He carefully kept wrapping papers, ribbons, and strings. Later on, they could serve him as sources for new ideas or as material for collage and drawings. If he especially liked the way a parcel had been wrapped, he didn't even open it. One day, he took all the envelopes which he'd laid aside for months and used them for gouache and drawings. Picasso working on a copperplate engraving. In this field, too, he was phenomenal. One of the Cromeling brothers who printed Picasso's test sheets on their hand press said, the masters of etching and copperplate engraving will get the surprise of their life with Picasso. Not only that he masters all difficulties of the craft without effort, he goes much further and achieves results which up to now were considered unobtainable. When engraving copperplate, Picasso sees himself mainly as a craftsman who tries with patience and love to penetrate the secrets of the art. Apart from the possibility of duplicating a work of art, 
He was especially interested in the engraved metal as a final product. He once said he would remain loyal to this type of artistic manifestation, even if only one print could be made from each plate. Kahnweiler maintained that Picasso had occupied himself so intensively with etchings in those last years, only because by chance, the Crommeling brothers were living at the same place. He has to have someone, he said, who collects the plates in the evening and brings the test print the very next morning. He wants to see the result so that he can work on it at once. And Aldo Kromelink said during the lifetime of Picasso, inquisitive and continuously driven by his enthusiasm, he's always looking for new techniques without despising the traditional methods which he applies with the same master craftsmanship. The surprising speed of his hand, of his mind and his imagination enables him to realize in one step what others would need several phases. But the need to communicate quickly does not exclude patience where it appears necessary to him. Some of his etchings, for example, the largest circus scene, have gone through many different stages. For him, they are not so much corrections as a way of penetrating deeper into his subject, to add, to specify, and to exhaust the material. He experiments continuously, and his impatience to see the first results of his work each time is very great. This is a first test print. Picasso handled all tools expertly, and he achieved this with the most subtle effects. He was convinced of the success of tireless experiments. Often he regarded a graphic design as completed only after 15 or even 30 different stages and hesitated even then to have it printed. A test print in the second stage. When looking at the different stages, an idea is gained of Picasso's untiring search for new forms of expression and his doubts which recurred again and again. A test print third stage. Picasso treating a copper plate. The fourth stage. The fifth stage. The sixth stage. Picasso has changed the nose. According to Kromelink, there are various difficult techniques in traditional copper plate engraving, which Picasso usually mixed in one working process. The plates treated in such a way give the impression that they've been treated over a long time in several stages. He must always have known very exactly what he wanted, Kromelink says, because at the moment you're actually carrying out the work, you have no visual control over what you're doing. When looking through the cartons which are flowing over with etchings, Picasso sometimes commented on his techniques. This here I have made with sugar, he said, for example, and this with acid. The wonderful thing about acid is that you do not see anything, just as if you worked with water. Here I've used a lithograph pencil. That is difficult as it's very greasy. This is a dry point engraving. In the judgment of the finest experts, Picasso used unusual new techniques as an engraver. He's created things which were regarded as unachievable in this art. Daniel Henri Kahnweiler, Picasso's companion and colleague from the time when they were both young and enthusiastic, right to their old age, which could not rob them of their enthusiasm. Kahnweiler, his friend and patron who was two years younger than Picasso, said of him shortly before he died, his life belongs wholly to painting. 
He thinks of nothing else. He does nothing but work. He spent his life working. He's traveled little. He was never in Germany. He visited Bern only once, and that was because his son happened to be staying there. He was occasionally in Italy, and he has taken part in communist congresses in Great Britain and Poland, and that is all. He's never traveled to see landscapes or anything else. He sees the outside world, but he does not search for it. Picasso himself says, I do not look for it, I find it. Picasso does not think of what he's going to do the next day. His work and his life renew themselves daily. That is the special thing about him. Braque and Juan Gris, for example, worked continuously, developed and improved, but not Picasso. Nobody knows what he will do the next day, not even himself. For him, life begins anew every day. This obsession, this creative urge, these are expressions of his genius. He's a painter who thinks only about his art. He lives for his art. Since I've known him, there is nothing else for him. He does not do anything else. The uniqueness about him is the pure unity of life and work in a time like ours, and the fact which is bordering on the wonderful, that he has retained his inexhaustible creativity up to his very advanced age. There is no cause for defending or justifying him. You can only praise him and talk about the admiration you feel for him. My admiration for him is unlimited. I have to admit that I think he is the greatest painter of our time, perhaps even the greatest painter of all time. The life of this man and the work of this man are marvels. These photographs of Picasso, taken the year before his death, show the exceptional vitality it retained until the very end. He died on the 8th of April, 1973, the evening before, it's still been working. <laughs>